Okay, we're going to go ahead and get going. I want to welcome uh, those of you who are streaming and those who are here on, in person to the May uh, Vermont lecture in our Vermont Center on Behavior and Health lecture series. And we're really um, in for a good one today. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kim Richter, who is a professor of population health at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. Uh, Kim received her uh, bachelor's degree in philosophy, which I just learned last night and was impressed to hear that. And then from there went on to graduate school and took a PhD in behavioral psychology at the University of Kansas, which uh, of course I knew that. And I, that's where I did my training uh, before Kim, but um, we share that. and. Um, Kim uh, did a lot of uh, postdoctoral training and joined the KU Med Center faculty in 1998 and has been active there in research since that time. Um, she's uh, really gone on to uh, have a wonderful career and uh, she's an expert in opioid and tobacco addictions as well as the emerging area of implementation science. Um, she has uh, received awards throughout her career. It started um, early with a Fulbright Award as a postdoctoral fellow, and then the uh, Society for Research in Nicotine uh, and Tobacco Research uh, Young Investigator Award. That same year, she won that award. She won a, uh, a Early Career Young Investigator Award from the Society for Behavioral Medicine. And those awards have just continued in one form or another throughout her career. She's an active mentor of pre-docs, post-docs, and early career faculty. Um, she developed a, a very impressive hospital uh, patient care policy at the University of Kansas Med Center that, back in 2006 that, that continues today, till today. And um, it's something that we've been trying to establish here at the University of Vermont Med Center. It's really just essential for good, <laughs> good patient care and yet very difficult to get going in my experience. So I really admire Kim's accomplishments there. Um, she's been active in NIH peer review, is very well funded by NIH uh, for her own research and including um, a Center of Biomedical Research Excellence um, P20 award that is uh, beginning, due to begin any day now that will be on implementation science. So Kim, thanks for being with us today and the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay, so can everybody hear me? Is it coming through? All right, great. And um, <clears throat> So I, um, for those of you online or for any of you in the audience, I um, am not good at noticing people who have questions. So I'm going to bust through my slides. But if you have a question, interrupt me. Say, Kim, and I will stop and ask your question because I'm just, I get on a roll and I just don't notice very well. So please, I, I would welcome questions or comments or whatever. Um, but I'm going to just run through these. Um, uh, pretty quickly and, and in a focused way, and then we'll, we should have time for a conversation afterwards. So I'm just going to focus on a study um, that uh, we call Changing the Default for Tobacco Treatment. And um, so let's see. So, uh, you know, has this ever happened to you or a family member where you, you see a healthcare provider and um, they identify some health issue? It might be a burning health issue or something like blood pressure, which is something definitely needs to be taken care of. And and they say, you know, they ask you if you're ready to, to do anything about this, you know, in the next 30 days. Or, you know, or they ask you, you know, are you willing to address this at this time? And, you know, maybe, maybe your answer is yes, but very often um, with most medical care, your answer is no, because traditionally uh, guidelines for the treatment of medical conditions involve identifying where the evidence base is in terms of treatment and then telling people, giving people their treatment options, what they should be, you know, what they could do to do something about the blood pressure, the asthma, the COPD, whatever, right? 
it doesn't involve asking people if they want to do anything about it. That's not usually part of treatment guidelines. But with um, a treatment of tobacco use disorder, it is ingrained in national guidelines in the US and across the world that we follow a 5A approach to tobacco treatment. And that involves assessing whether somebody uses tobacco, advising them that it's a good idea to quit for their health, and then assessing whether, uh, did I say assessing, asking if they're a tobacco user, advising them to quit, and then assessing whether they're interested in quitting. And then if they're not, you're supposed to deliver a motivational intervention. And if they are, then you're supposed to assist them, that's a fourth A, with evidence-based treatment, which is medications and counseling. And then you're supposed to, the fifth A is a range follow-up because we know that it's a chronic relapsing condition and people need multiple quit attempts to be able to quit. So, you know, that's assessing whether somebody's interested in quitting is the third A and the five A's. Now, what is the evidence for, for assessment um, in that, in the rubric of the five A's? It's one C in the guidelines, which means that it's strongly recommended, but there's low quality evidence that it makes a difference in helping people in, in, in boosting quit rates. Now, the fourth step, assist, which involves medications and supportive counseling, is a 1A because it's strongly recommended that providers do this. And there's also really high, tons of high quality evidence that medications help people quit smoking and supportive counseling helps people quit smoking. So, you know, we, so it's kind of weird that we have that assessed still in there. Even it's in the national guidelines internationally, there's no evidence for, no evidence. Um, and we also know from a few studies that people who are unwilling to quit, who say that they're not planning on quitting or they're not even you know, willing to try to make a quit attempt, actually, if they're given treatment, they quit at the same rates as other people. So Ed Ellerbeck ran a study um, looking at a chronic disease approach to tobacco treatment where he repeatedly offered people four times over six, uh, in, in six months increments um, the opportunity to quit um, again. And so people who had relapsed or never even tried to quit could try again. And um, he enrolled people at all levels of readiness to quit. It wasn't an eligibility criteria. And he found that, that you know, people who, who said they were not motivated, actually, they had the same rates of cessation. And there was this other study that, um, that enrolled all comers. And they did ask people if they were planning on quitting in the next month. And... Um, and, but then they let everybody enroll in groups and 35% um, of the people who enrolled quit, but only half of those who quit had said they were planning on quitting or willing to quit. So, you know, so the benefits for offering people treatment, regardless of their willingness, looks like it's pretty good. And we don't know if there are any harms attached to it. Um, there just hasn't been any studies on that. So it looks like the balance in terms of what the recommendation should be is kind of on the, the, the side of proactively treating people because we know, know some people will quit who say they're not ready. And we know um, there's also some other evidence that we just have asked people about satisfaction with their providers. And people tend to be more satisfied with providers who address their tobacco use and offer cessation. Um, and we know if we don't proactively treat, we're going to miss, like if we ask people if they're willing and only treat them, people who say they're willing, we're going to miss, you know, up to 80% of smokers. Now, along with that, those considerations, we know from other lines of research that treatment defaults affect behaviors. So for, for any choice in, in your life, there's a default, and that's what's going to happen if you don't do anything. So we all are familiar with defaults when we're setting up our computer. You know, this file is by default going to go here, but would you like it to go somewhere else? And usually we go along with the default. Um, and we know, and, and, and so a number of studies have demonstrated that making uh, an option, the default really increases the chances that it will occur. And the classic example of, of this was a, a study that was published in Science on organ donation. Um, and comparing international organ donation rates. And in Germany, nobody's a donor, but you, and you have to opt in to check a box saying, yes, I would like to be an organ donor. Like, I think it's a motor registration. And in Austria, everyone is a donor, but you have to check a box to say you don't want to be a donor. And, you know, the difference in donor rates are very striking between the two countries. And we also know in terms of HIV screening, when clinicians make it opt out, 
um, then um, more, much many more people are, are more likely to participate in it than if they ask people if they want to do it. So there looks like good evidence that um, that maybe changing how you approach, maybe changing how you offer treatment to people might um, involve more people in treatment. And if more people are involved in treatment, then perhaps we can get more people to quit. So we decided to conduct a study on opt-in versus opt-out treatment for tobacco use disorder. And we did it in a hospital setting because number one, um, I have a treatment service in the hospital and I have a complete list of smokers in the hospital. And so it's very easy to recruit from there. But also because we have a complete list of every smoker, smoker in a hospital bed in the hospital. So we can do a population-based study because we're, we can we can pick from everybody. Everybody has an equal opportunity of being a participant. And um, so that's another advantage of doing it in the hospital. So in the hospital, you know, opt-in treatment is what our service actually still provides sort of right now. Um, and it looks like this. You, um, we, we offer when we see a patient in the hospital to adjust or get them on inpatient medication if they would like. We offer a brief advice to quit. We ask them if they're willing to try to quit. And if they say yes, then we offer them a treatment plan. We could create a treatment plan for, you know, how you're going to handle these triggers or whatever. Um, and then we offer to arrange for post-discharge medications, a script for medication. And then we offer to uh, fax refer them to the quit line. So that's how opt-in care looks in the hospital. And it looks that way in a lot of places that utilize sort of quit lines for their, their, their mode of treatment for tobacco use disorder. So optical treatment is much simpler. Because basically, we, what you, how you would flip this to an opt-out paradigm is that you provide medication. Okay, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to get your healthcare provider to write a script for you to keep you comfortable while you're in the hospital. And what makes it opt-out is the person has to say no in order to not get it. They have to opt out from treatment. Um, you, we provided brief advice to quit because it's part of the five A's. And then um, an opt-out paradigm would you know, do a treatment plan, um, just sort of rock straight into that, and then ask them what kind of medication they would like on discharge, not would they like a medication on discharge, but what kind of medication would you like on discharge, and arrange for that, uh, some kind of script on discharge, and then provide some kind of support. So that's what our study did. Now, I do want to point out that some people in tobacco control, I don't know what the proper tobacco research, um, don't really uh, have a good sense of what the difference is between opt-in and opt-out. So in opt-in, according to the guidelines, you're supposed to ask everybody if they're willing to try to quit, and if they say yes, offer cessation-oriented treatment, medications and counseling if no motivate. But in an opt, a true opt-out paradigm, people get medications and counseling unless they say, I don't want it. Okay. Now, how some people in tobacco control operationalize opt out is that they offer support and medication support to all. So they they don't ask people if they're willing to quit. They just say, would you like medications? Would you like counseling? I can do this. But it's not a true opt out because people are not going to get the medications and counseling unless they opt in. So a true opt out is where this is what's going to happen unless people put the brakes on. So I hope that's clear. So that's um, a pure opt-out approach to tobacco treatment. So, and, and how we framed our language around how our counselors would actually present these treatment options to people. It's got a fancy name uh, called choice architecture that maybe was coined by, you know, the authors of the book Nudge, where you're, you're, you, you, you configure your language so that um, People, the essence of it is you can ask a question, would you like medication? And then they have to say yes to opt in. But, but an opt out approach would be sort of stating that this is what's going to happen and then they have to say no. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all these different things, but we actually had very involved treatment manuals and training just to make that one freaking little change because it's very hard for people to do. They're so used to asking people, would you like this? Would you like that? Not, this, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. All of the, our people are trained in motivational intervention and, you know, so it's hard. Um, 
So now to run our study, there were a couple of things that we had to do differently from uh, a sort of vanilla clinical trial. So we, we did delayed consent. So we identified people from the electronic medical record. We did some pre-screening um, at the computer, and then we completed screening at the bedside. And if they were eligible, we randomized to get opt-in or opt-out care. And then a month after, um, we called them up and told them they were in a clinical trial. Would they like to consent to this procedure? And the reason is, we thought if we consented them at first, then we'd lose all the people who weren't interested in quitting. So we felt like we had to do this first. And uh, so that's a little twist on it, this delayed consent procedure. And we also decided to use an adaptive trial um, where uh, it's a Bayesian adaptive design where we um, did interim analyses every 13 weeks and we re-weighted the randomization, which is so hard to say, re-weighted the randomization to favor the stronger treatment arm. Uh, so, you know, within a two-arm study, you don't get more power from doing this kind of adaptive design. With more arms, you do because you're loading up um, the better performing arms with more people. Uh, so you might get, um, you, you might have, you would have more power. But one, one advantage to this was that um, we were doing delayed consent, you know, and so we weren't letting people know they were in a study, but we were doing our best to get them the more effective treatment as the trial went on. I hope that makes sense. So it was a Bayesian design study. And also, I have a biostatistician I adore, and he loves doing these designs. And he was like, well, we got to do this. And I wanted to keep this guy. So I said, okay, Byron, you get, you get to do this kind of design. Um, and it was, it was useful. Um, so we did it at the University of Kansas Hospital. And our aim was to determine the population impact of changing the default. And our hypothesis was that more people who were randomized uh, in opt out, we'll use medications and counseling because more people would have an opportunity to. And the abstinence from smoking one month post randomization compared to opt in, we had some other aims. So, just to revisit what an adaptive trial is, it's a design that um, allows for prospectively planned modifications to different aspects of the design based on accumulating data. And those, um, those changes have to be planned and you have to have a clear trigger or decision point um, as to you know, what, what is the, the, the cutoff for, for deciding to make a change or not. So you know, it's not like you can change things willy-nilly. And they're supported by FDA because they can be more efficient if you have multiple arms. And um, so our design um, involved initially randomizing people equally to the two arms until 400 participants were randomized, so 200 people in each arm. And then after that, that we started doing the interim analyses uh, to change the uh, allocation to weight uh, more towards a better performing arm. And, um, and we would keep doing that um, either until we, we hit a certain probability that one arm was better than the other, or we hit 1,000 patients. Okay, so and I, there's other people who can give you more details on that. So our primary income uh, outcome was a rate uh, of seven-day biochemically verified cigarette abstinence. And we had other income points. So one thing I want to point out, just about at the, the finding, is that um, you will not see p-values in the results because, um, you know, what is a p-value? Um, you know, it, it means that the probability of being more extreme than the test statistics summarizing the differences, I have to read this because I can't say it out loud, between drugs A and B under the null hypothesis that drug A is the same as drug B is blah, what the p-value is. So it's a very, very roundabout way of looking at probability of effects. So, so you know, another way to do it is just calculating the probability that one arm outperforms the other. And that's what I will be talking about. It's the probability that one arm outperforms the other. And then you just have to decide whether that's a high enough probability for you. Okay, so this is how the study went. Uh, we identified smoking status at admission. We randomly, randomly selected people into the trial um, and, and, and then uh, randomly, oh no. And then we provide a brief uh, advice to quit with a, and a pamphlet. 
And then we went to the, or after we went to the bedside, and then we did some more eligibility as, assessment while we were there at the bedside. And then we randomly allocated people into groups. And um, then um, for opt out, people got a treatment plan, they got counseling, and they got a prescription um, for, at discharge and a starter kit of nicotine replacement therapy. And if they were an opt in, if during our, our intake, um, which we didn't tell them was intake, it looked like our clinical intake, right? We, we had assessed willingness to quit. And if they said they were willing to quit, then they were offered medications and they were offered counseling and offered to do a treatment plan. If they had said, no, they weren't willing to quit, then they got a motivational intervention. Okay. So then um, uh, people in opt-in who said yes, who accepted uh, counseling, got four sessions of counseling after they were discharged and people and everybody in opt out unless they said no they didn't want counseling uh they all got counseling uh four sessions of counseling and discharge and then one month we we told debriefed with them told them they were in study invited them to participate and we got our one month outcome and did biochemical verification and then we did the same at six months okay so this is how the the allocation looked, and there's some clues as to how the study panned out as we go. So we screened uh, about 2,700 people. Uh, we randomized 1,000, so we never hit the end point. Um, 345 were randomized to opt in, and 655 were randomized to opt out. So there's some information there. And um, then uh, we were able to enroll about 74% of, of people who had been randomized. And um, then we were able to collect. And then, of course, um, we got one month outcome data from those folks. And then at six months, we were, we were able to follow up with almost everybody that um, had consented. So when you look at, you know, usually your table one is whether randomization works or not. And for us, it's sort of whether randomization worked or not. And also, how did, was there any differential dropout due to our delayed consent? because we randomized people and then we consented them and then we only collected uh, involved data on people who, of course, consented to be in the trial. And when you look at different um, you know, uh, uh, demographics, et cetera, of the two groups who ended up consenting into the study, there was only one difference that was kind of marked. And this is a Cohen's uh, um, effect size. Um, it was in use of e-cigarettes in the past 30 days. Otherwise, it didn't look like there was differential dropout um, in term at the point of consent uh, into the trial. Okay, so our one month main outcomes in terms of biochemically verified quit rates at one month, um, it was 15.8% of people in opt in were quit and biochemically verified quit, 21.5% in opt out. I'm on a timer. Um, oops, is this six months? One month. Okay, good. Um, in opt out were quit, and the Bayesian posterior probability that opt out performed better than opt in was 97%. Okay. So for six months, um, opt out was a little bit better in terms of percent quit than opt in. Um, so 18.5% versus 17.8%. And the uh, posterior probability that it was better was 0.59. So almost a flip of the coin at six months. So whatever effects you were one month went away by six months, which is not surprising. Okay. So in terms of medication use and counseling, which was part of our hypothesis, the uh, red bars are opt out you know, or whatever that is, brown bars and the gray bars are opt-in. And it looks like in terms of people who accepted a starter pack of nicotine replacement therapy, who reported that they used medications post-discharge and people who took one or more um, uh, counseling calls post-discharge basically opt-out doubled treatment engagement um, compared to opt-in. And uh, the Bayesian posterior probability that that was that opt out outperformed opt in was one for all of those. So, you know, it was better. Okay. Now, um, some people um, object to opt out treatment because they say that you are manhandling, we're, we're coercing people to do something they wouldn't necessarily do. And so we actually looked at whether people felt coerced to, to 
engage in treatment or quit. And so we adapted some questions from um, uh, this admission experience survey, which is for uh, admission involuntary, or well, not involuntary admission, maybe, admission to um, uh, mental health care. And so in terms of uh, one item, I had a lot of control over whether I tried to quit, and that's that all these higher bars here. Um, it looks like um, opt out um, had a 75% probability of, of people endorsing that they had a lot of control over opt in. Isn't that weird? So the people that got opt out here, they said, I had more control, or more of them said, I, I had a lot of control. Isn't that interesting? And um, in terms of, I didn't feel forced to try to commit. So this is reverse question. Um, fewer people in opt out endorsed that I, they didn't feel forced to try to quit compared to people in opt in. Sorry. Is it still showing? Yeah. So, um, so that makes kind of sense that, that people in opt in were a little more likely to say I didn't feel forced. Um, but the, uh, the posterior probability, yeah. So, so that, the posterior probability that opt out was higher than opt in was very, very low. Sorry, you have to do some mental gymnastics sometimes with, with that as an outcome. Okay, so in terms of cost effectiveness, when you look at the difference in put rates and you multiply that by the cost of treatment, it looks like um, it costs about $678 to get an additional quit in the opt out arm, which seems like a lot, but actually for cardiac rehab or something like that, probably it's a lot higher. So it actually is a pretty cheap intervention to get a quit. And um, so, you know, that's really the findings. Um, and so the question is, what do we do with this? Um, we obviously need another study to look at, see what we can do to get longer term quit rates. Um, a lot of people object to opt out care because they feel that it's coercive or paternalistic. Um, but I, I kind of have to ask what is more paternalistic, you know, asking if they're ready and then only giving medications to people who ding, 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 give the right answer. We're just giving medications to everybody and letting them decide whether they want it or not, number one. And, you know, people in um, uh, do um, treatment or, or decision research um, have sort of argued that where there's you know, strong evidence that supports a given therapy, you should set the default to, to favor you know, shunting people into that, right? And they can always say no to whatever treatment they get. And also there's you know, another thought that we should set the defaults according to you know, the, the options that would make the choosers better off as they as judged by themselves, like if somebody says, yeah, I'd really like to quit someday, maybe not in the next 30 days, maybe the default should be set for engaging in treatment that is opt out. So, um, so if opt out proves to be more effective, um, if, if we can figure out ways to get, well, number one, it's super effective in getting people into treatment, and then we need other things to help maintain those quit rates. So I, I argue, I believe that this study demonstrates that this is the better way to, in, to offer treatment to people, to approach treatment with people. Um, we're going to deliver care to more people. This will simplify the treatment algorithm because people don't have to decide whether somebody's ready or not. They just get treatment to everybody. And there's no excuse for not treating. And I think that this is a lot of what determines uptake of tobacco treatment in, 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 in institutions is that people don't believe that folks are going to benefit from treatment unless they're ready, unless they're willing. They think that willpower is, is a main ingredient, maybe the only ingredient, tr truthfully. And, and people think this way about obesity and some other things too. So it takes away an excuse for not treating people. If you're, maybe you just say you're too busy. And it just simplifies it, and this, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. And you know, it has the potential to, you know, save a lot of lives. Okay, so I don't know that I need to.
be a dead horse anymore. How am I doing on time here? Pretty good, eh? I don't have I don't have a lot more slides, so I'll go through these too. Okay, so we can do the math. In a population of 100 people, what's better? You know, a 50% quit rate among 20% of the people. Like with smoking, it would be, I can get half the people to quit who are ready to quit when only one in five people are ready to quit. Or if a 20% quit rate among 100% of people. And when you do the math, um, a population-based intervention probably would be better. And so, you know, I feel that in some ways, it's not, it could be this opt-in mentality and approach and national guidelines for tobacco treatment could be the single biggest barrier to providing treatment. Because if it were the national guidelines that you're supposed to identify tobacco users and then provide treatment, then we would figure out a lot of other things like funding, um, who's going to provide that treatment, et cetera. We would, we would be forced to figure that out. So in some ways, I think that that opt-in paradigm is the single, single biggest barrier to providing treatment. So you know, this study in particular found that compared uh, to opt-in, opt-out, had a high probability of improving quit rates at one month and a low, almost a flip of the coin probability of improving quit rates at six months. Uh, but it definitely, sorry, um, uh, opt-out did a lot better than opt-in at getting medications to people and counseling to people and improving their sense of control over quitting. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I think this is what it is. So if you, be, you have kids, you don't, you know, wake them up in the morning and say, Johnny, do you want to wear a shirt to school today? That is not on the table. Do you want to wear a blue shirt or a red shirt to school today? Or are you pink or purple? You know, then Johnny has lots of choices and you can have a lot of discussion over that. And Johnny will feel very empowered and not quite realize that not wearing a shirt was not on the table. So that is kind of the, the, the baseline for me um, is that, you know, receiving treatment shouldn't necessarily be on the table. Okay. Okay. And the cost really that we found was not very high for uh, preventive intervention to get a quit. Okay, so what do, so I'm just gonna uh, skip this. You can talk about it. This is the team. Okay, so um, we could stop and talk a little bit about this study right now if you'd like. Um, I do have some slides on the COBRI, which is which are actually not that interesting. Um, you know, they just sort of have the structure and Venn diagrams and stuff like that. And, you know, you guys know what a COBRA looks like. Um, so, I don't know, why don't we just stop here and, you know, we can talk about the COBRA later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. And I would welcome comments too, observations. I can tell you what study we're designing to follow up on this, but anyway. Thanks for a great talk. Yeah, uh, thanks. Such an important topic, and really exciting findings. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, there's some thought that uh, interventions for smokers who are not ready to quit now um, are affected by increasing uh, the rate of quit attempts versus interventions that increase quit success on a given it seems like this might be a good example of that. I wonder if you have any data or any thoughts on whether the opt-out intervention affected the rate of quit attempts per se. on it. I didn't put it in there. And uh, because it was um, a significant outcome, we put it into our main outcome, and I forgot to put it here. But it absolutely increased quit attempts uh, with a BPP of one over opt-in. Opt so out, opt-out got a lot more quit attempts and opt in. I can't remember what the what the findings were, but I can look it up in the paper and tell you. But absolutely. That, so that, that might have been at play as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, then the follow-up question to that is, I wonder if among people who made a quit attempt, the rate of quit success did. Because you'd expect that, you know, for those who got the opt out, you'd see population effect because more people are trying, but maybe you're getting people who are less ready, less prepared to actually succeed at a given quit attempt. Doesn't mean it's not prompting that, 
I wonder if the rate of success differed among those who attempted. So um, comparing people who may quit attempts in opt-out versus people who may quit attempts in opt-in, whether um, the, the, the quit rate was higher. So you'd have to, you would have to include everybody who successfully quit and everybody who tried, who said they tried to make a, who made a quit attempt. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Because I can't remember how we, I, we may have calculated a quit attempt only based on people who weren't, didn't successfully quit. I'll have to look at that and see, which seems a little, little weird now that I think about it. Everybody who quit, of course, made a quit attempt by default. But then there are other people who made quit attempts that didn't successfully quit. So we'd have to add quits and quit attempts together and compare them across the arms. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, really interesting. Stuff. I haven't yes. done it. We, we will look at it. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. I have a question from the uh, online group. Uh -huh. that I think the latest is going to read. Okay. That's what I was just told. Bill? Are you available? Or is Charlie going to be? Okay, so uh, uh, we uh, have one moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have uh, actually a few uh, online questions, but I will start with uh, Mikhail Kafarnas. Uh, did the opt out intervention increase the quit readiness or interest in treatment of participants who didn't end up quitting? I haven't looked at that, so we should we we should we will look at it. So increased did it did opt out increase um, willingness to quit or motivation to quit? And we did we did ask that at one month and six month. I'm pretty sure. So we we can look at that. I don't know. It's a it's a good question. So not only did it increase medications and counseling, but because everybody got a shot at it, or got it unless they didn't want it, did their motivation go up? Or it could have gone down if they got medication and they didn't quit. They could be disappointed in themselves. So it's, it would be worth looking at. And I don't know. I, I have a, a comment, and I, I'd be uh, interested in your thoughts on it. Well, first of all, thanks for a terrific talk. Yeah. Secondly, I think your, your um, insight on how to analyze the five A's and zeroing in on what's the evidence supporting assessing readiness to quit yeah it was brilliant uh, i had never seen that kind of analysis but spot on i think um one of the studies i think would be worth doing if it, it would depend on somebody knowing how to do it but is assessing um the prevalence of opt-out approaches in other areas of medicine and i shared something with sarah i all the other I had a bicycle accident. This is saying anecdotal, but still, I think relevant. Uh -huh. I had a bicycle accident a couple summers ago, and it, I knew I had hurt my hip, but I didn't think it was too bad. But anyhow, I got talked into uh, um, by my caring daughter. Go, go to the urgent care and get checked out. Mm -hmm. So I get checked out. Uh, they did an X-ray, and then they did while they were waiting for the uh, results of the X-ray, a uh, physician did a, a physical exam. And he didn't think there was a fracture. The x-ray came back. And indeed, there was a fracture. Was? Yes. Uh -huh. He did not say, what do you want to do? He said, you're going to the ER to get ready for surgery. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because I, I, did, I wasn't familiar. I, <laughs> I'd never been in this situation before. And I get clarification. You mean, I, no, you're going over to the uh, ER, which is another building to get surgery uh -huh, uh -huh. and that's where I went and um I suspect that may be the kind of care we provide in a lot of areas in medicine there's I didn't question his rationale and I'm sure there's a good reason for going to surgery if you have a hip fracture yeah. but there is definitely good reason for getting treatment if you're a current smoker because 50 percent chance you'll be dead yeah. down the road yeah. if you don't do something yeah absolutely change yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, but how would great. we approach that study? So maybe somebody in the audience has an idea, but I, I think it would be worth it. it. It could help to advance 
to use in, in the area of addictions with this mo- of mm-hmm. use of this model mm-hmm. if we knew where how how often it was used in other areas of medicine. I I I love that idea. I mean, I, I think you probably have to do a lot of recording and coding. Um, I mean, I can't think of another way to do it because it's so it's it happens in a second, and yet the difference is, uh, you know, tremendous because. Because there's this thing called, oh, and I didn't present this data, and I should have. So people think defaults work, and this is just somebody pulling out of the air, I think, or I don't know, by by this idea that there's an implied recommendation or implied endorsement of a way to, do, to go. And so your doctor, by saying, okay, now you're going to the ER, was saying, this is the way to go. This is what I think you should do. But if your doctor would have said, you know, do you want surgery? You can have surgery if you wanted. Then maybe you would think, well, I don't know, what are the risks of surgery? And da, 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 da. And, you know, so the doctor, by framing it as an opt out, like you would have had to say, no, 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 I'm not going to surgery, uh, and delivered in a recommendation that this is what you should do. And because the physician is somebody who hopefully knows a lot more about this than we do, then we go along with it. And so um, that that implied recommendation, that, that is just, it just happens so quickly, but it seems to be powerful. But I don't know how you'd measure it other than with, uh, with audio recordings of, of interactions. Our treatment guidelines from other disciplines. Well, yes. So, you know, there are ways you can operationalize it. So you can have, like, we have this funny story in our, um, in our hospital tobacco treatment uh, program, uh, we've tried to get ourselves inserted into order sets. So like checklists of things that people should get if they have COPD or if they have heart failure or hit this and that. So we got on the heart failure um, order set. And so um, default check to refer uh, people to, you can't quit our tobacco treatment program. So we would just get called right over there. But they didn't crosswalk it with people's smoking status. So we got default referred, you know, orders for every single person with heart failure. <laughs> so um, how did I get started on that story? Oh, so there, so we could, we could look at that, but, you know, as a way of measuring opt-out care. But, but that, that's very uncommon. Yeah, so I think yeah, it would be it would be interesting. Yeah, but I think that national guidelines by not like by de-implementing uh, this in our national guidelines, it would make a big difference because the guidelines would be identify tobacco users, users provide this care, uh, and then they and they would have to change the language around how you provide that care too to say people we're changing things here. You're not supposed to offer medications. You need to deliver medication. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know how I got on that. So anyway, questions, comments. Uh, we have, uh, Leah Lambert, uh, says, hello, are the medications uh, covered by insurance and do people pay out of pocket for things they get on discharge? It is a great question. Um, in that very uh, by insurance plan and state. So the Affordable Care Act um, anchored um, insurance coverage of uh, preventive services to the preventive services, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations. So if things for preventive services had an A or B level of evidence for treatment, then um, insurance plans, including the marketplace and private plans, are and yeah, marketplace and, and private plans are supposed to cover all all treatments with ARB level evidence, and that covers cessation medications. So a lot of people don't realize this, but all the marketplace plans cover all of the cessation medications. Most private insurance, and it's getting to be more and more, cover all of the all the medic- with smoking cessation medications without copay or pre-authorization. Um, 
And um, there's a few, if, if the plan existed before the Affordable Care Act was passed, they don't have to follow that for any, for any preventive services. But if it, if it exists afterwards, then they do. So coverage for medications is better than people think. And Medicaid programs vary by state, but most do. And any that expanded, I believe, have to follow the, um, the um, Affordable Care Act guidelines. And in Kansas, we got Medicaid. Did I say Medicare? I meant Medicaid. We got Medicaid to cover all cessation medications and combinations for four quit attempts per year. So they have seamless coverage and they can try combinations and stuff. So um, people's coverage is better than they think. Um, and they just, just don't realize it. You kind of have to find out what, what applies in your state. Medicaid, Medicare is a pain because Part D, they have to have a Part D plan. and they, um, the Medicare Part D only covers prescription medications. So Chantix or Bupropion or nasal spray or na nasal spray, people know about nasal spray, or the inhaler are both still prescription. Um, so, um, and often they'll only cover one of those things. So that was a very long, and often quit lines will provide medications for one month or more. So in Kansas, it's one month. Your questions, comments. Thanks for a great talk. Um, where my mind immediately goes is, well, I guess what I really like is the simplification of the decision tree. But they don't want it. I'm wondering how personalized medicine particularly applies to this. And I guess one, you know, not just a follow-up study. This is this is on the line. If we could use a big data approach to try and find out which there's, there's various different styles of cessation of quitting, um, and so we could predict which one you'd be most likely to succeed at, and then get you get that to be an opt out for you. That way, we could at least use the framing effect of look based on these either demographic or or just these these how about you. This is the approach that has been best in people who are like yeah. Yeah, and, and there are people who are looking at differential effectiveness of the different medications based on people's, I don't know, how they metabolize it, or there's different, I don't know anything about this. Um, there you go. Um, and um, I don't know that anybody's been trying that. People do it, have done it with, um, like with um, carbon monoxide and spirometry and said, oh, this is your long age. You should do this, you know. Um, and I don't think that the spirometry and, and counseling had, was better than not. Um, but but I the idea of trying to figure out which medication will work best for them and being able to give them that rationale, I think would be could be very powerful. And also could rule out medications that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. It could be. It could be that the baseline differences in opt out had some impact, uh, and in the e cigarette use had some impact on the outcome. We did not control for that. It was a pretty small percentage of people, but we had a lot of people study so it was a good number of people um yep i i we can look at that yeah yeah hi thank you very much um so i just had a uh i guess a clarification question um you noted that in the month um i guess following referral or like treatment onset initiation Randomization. Randomization. Yeah, because we split randomization and enrollment. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So there was randomization in the month after that. Then we consented and enrolled. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there were. Thanks. Yeah. Um, there were one to four counseling sessions. Uh huh. So um, I was wondering if you looked at whether there were like differential rates of attendance between the two groups, and so that's that's one question, and then. Um, 
were they so who delivered the counseling sessions and were they in person or over the phone? The sessions were over the phone. And in terms of your question, so the, you know, part of the effect of the opt out was that everybody got it. And in the opt in arm, not everybody got counseling. Most, almost everybody got the counseling and opt out. Very few people opt out, opted out from the counseling. In the opt in arm, the only people who were eligible to be offered the counseling were the people who said they were willing to quit. So that cut out a chunk of people who were not willing. And, um, and then what you're saying is among the people who we know that the counseling um, was better in opt out. I mean, there were more people, higher percentage of people randomized opt out participated in counseling. And at compared least, to opt in. Yep, yep. In at least one session, I think. Yes, in at least one. Oh, and you were asking yes, that number but, of sessions. Yes, right. I will look. I'm not sure. We decided to operationalize that, it that way. But I don't know that we've looked at another way yet. So okay. we can look at that. We, we, we just published this recently, and we were kind of pushing on the analyses. Um, yeah, so, so we haven't done a lot of follow-up analyses. So you were wondering if number of sessions attended was differed, the, by, was differ, differed by the different groups. Correct, uh, yep, uh, yep. We can look at that. Thanks, Kim. Really cool study. Oh, yeah. Um, you talked about how difficult it is to get people to switch providers, to switch from asking to telling. How many people did you have to train? How did you train them? And over what period of time did the study take? Like, did you have to do booster sessions? Were there new people that had to be trained later on? Like, what were some of the like, practical aspects of the study? Well, so. The people who did all of that were the counselors and you can't quit. And I am their boss. <laughs> so this was not a pragmatic trial. It wasn't an implementation study. It was purely a test of opt-in versus opt-out. We it was not easy training our counselors to do opt-out. They would keep wanting to say, you would hear on the recording if it's okay with you in the opt-out condition and we're like no because then they have to say yes you can't say that because that's a very mi thing to say motivational interviewing thing to say so we had to beat it out of our counselors uh yeah not really but um you know we recorded almost every inpatient session and did and we did and i didn't include that either boy i thought i had all the data in here i'll have to go back and put more in um so we did fidelity assessment um, on a, a large uh, group of 450 um, inpatient encounters, um, and and we we did supervision based on that and gave people feedback, and we really had to police it among people who are really really good research counselors. Um, and um, yeah, so I think it will just be hard for people. To just make that mental switch and say, just like, it's okay, now you're going to the ER. It's like, okay, now, you know, you could even give yourself a little out by saying, you know, we just think it's so important we treat everybody. Well, I'm going to write a script for you, medication. Let's talk about what kind of medication you would like. You know, to just make that switch, I think, will be hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I, I'm, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. That's, yeah. And then you mentioned also that you were, um, you have another study in development. Can you tell us yes. about that? So uh, Dr. Babalola Fasheru, who is a co-investigator on the number two here um, on the trial, you can't see it anymore. Uh, he and I are putting together um, a grant in June 5th on, um, on opt-out treatment. And what we're, what we're asking is under what conditions can opt-out um, um, outperform out opt-in for long-term cessation. So our op, our control arm is opt-in usual care, and our we have three comparison arms of opt-out versus different levels of of longitudinal support. One is more medication, more free medication when they walk out the door. One will be um, 
a telemedicine visit like three months out to, uh, to reset any quit attempts or encourage people to quit. And the other will be um, uh, text messaging. And the text messaging will be like, um, as it was done with uh, Dr. Tanisha Sherman, who's also another co-investigator with pregnant smokers, where she, she um, would assess their tobacco use every week by text message um, and, then, um, and then provide um, messages according to where people are. And, and we will use that to trigger a telemedicine visit um, if um, somebody relapses. Um, or if they've never quit, we'll set, we'll set, a, we'll, we'll, we'll try to use text messaging to enhance the telemedicine. So all of these things should build on each other. So there's three arms, medication alone, medication plus uh, a telemedicine visit and medication. No, medica everybody gets medication. Sorry, we're, we're still working on this. Everybody gets medication and then one group gets medication and a telemedicine visit and the other group gets medication telemedicine visit and text messaging, which will check in with them and trigger an earlier text messaging visit. If, if need be. So that's what we're, th we're thinking that we, 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 I just, I think the idea is that we are not gonna replace opt-in as a treatment paradigm. You can't show that there's a clear pathway to getting more quits in the long term. I don't, it shouldn't be necessary for replacing opt in treatment because we get more treatment and we get more short term quit rates. But for, for people who write national guidelines for people in the tobacco control community, I think we need to kind of show the way to long term quits. And I think the, the meta question is does cherry picking people? According to willingness to give and giving them crappy intervention, um, can you do better than that by treating everybody you should be treating with a decent amount of treatment? So people who write guidelines for blood pressure control and stuff like that, they don't say, oh, first ask people if they want to control their blood pressure. Then take those people and give them this intervention. And if they don't like it, it's too bad for them. They say, what can we do to get blood pressure control be down in a population. And that's what we should be asking about today. Well, I think that wrapped it up pretty well yes. because <laughs> I agree. I sit here pondering, you know, what's the difference? Why the opt-out approach to a hip fracture but not to smoking cessation? I think the person making the recommendation around the hip fracture says, this is important. Bad stuff's going to happen if you don't go. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yet with smoking, we kind of Yep. This week, yep. what you just summarized. Yeah, yeah, and and this 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 will work for you, and a lot of it might be that providers don't believe that these medications and support work, you know, um, but they do. Yeah, uh, and another great thing about your lecture was the way you approached the fall off and the effect of the opt out group over time was not that that meant both treatments are about the same and we should not worry about oh, it. Oh, yes. But if we had a good start, how do we sustain it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very well done. Thanks. Thanks for sharing.